Hello, I'm Enzo, and today I'll be playing Auction Not Included. In this episode, we'll be talking about carbon dioxide, both geysers and vents. The first pipe is a carbon dioxide vent. This outputs extremely hot carbon dioxide, but at extremely low amounts. The geyser outputs extremely cold carbon dioxide in a liquid form at slightly higher amounts. The average geyser output is completely random. No two geysers are the exact same. In this episode, we'll also be going over uses for carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is a byproduct, first and foremost. As we can see here, there aren't many options for what you do with carbon dioxide. You can carbon skim it, which is the most common method, but this gives you absolutely nothing and wastes power and filtration medium. Dev life support is the developer thing, that doesn't matter. Here's your first auction solution, algae terrarium. Now, I don't do this. This is actually extremely wasteful. You lose water and precious algae in the process. Sure, you do get some auction back, but honestly, I don't think it's worth it. You should keep your water. You also have to deal with the polluted water that it outputs. Which brings you down to your last options, oxyferns. Oxyferns are also very inefficient. I'll tell you why I don't recommend that later. Betas. Betas consume carbon dioxide. Betas are like bees in real life. Carbon dioxide calms them down so that you can harvest enriched uranium from their hives. It is not worth it at all. If the carbon dioxide isn't absolutely freezing, then the betas will actually die due to the heat. So you have to be very careful. That's why you should always keep your betas in a vacuum. More importantly, here's the real use for carbon dioxide. Slixers. They consume 20 kilograms a cycle and output half of that in crude oil or petroleum. Now the type of slixer depends completely on how hot your room is. If the room is above around 250 degrees Fahrenheit, they'll actually have a higher chance to produce molten slixers, and you get straight up petroleum out of that. Otherwise, it's just normal slixers that output crude oil. So that's your options for carbon dioxide. So what do you do with geysers? Normally, I just seal them. I do absolutely nothing with them. I don't see a purpose for using them. But this video is about showing off uses for these. So let's get to the first one. The first use, oxyferns. Oxyferns are a plant that convert carbon dioxide into oxygen, although at a very inefficient rate. They are incredibly slow, making them not extremely viable. Now, assuming you naturally planted these, they're only 25% efficient. You can use pips to naturally plant them. I don't like growing them domestically because it gets very expensive if you have a bunch of these at once. So this is the easier method. But very slowly over time, it will convert carbon dioxide to oxygen. The issue is that's 156 milligrams. It's not grams, milligrams. If we do the math, a duplicate breathes out 2 grams of oxygen normally, which is 2,000 milligrams. These plants can only take 156 milligrams. You need about 13 plants just to sustain a duplicate. This is what that would look like. This is 13 oxyferns just for one little duplicate. That's extremely inefficient, and this is the best way to pit plant them. So I don't recommend it. If we go back to either one of the first examples, either 67 or 136 grams, let's just say even at an average of 100 grams of output, you would need 800 oxyferns naturally planted just to be able to handle one geyser or vent. So oxyferns are not the best method for dealing with carbon dioxide, unfortunately. Besides venting carbon dioxide into space or doing nothing with it, that leaves us with one option. That's slixers. Slixers are very interesting creatures. They consume 20 kilograms of carbon dioxide and output 10 crude oil per cycle. But here's the catch. They can only live in extremely hot areas. Although they can live up to extremely high temperatures. That's why some industrial sauna setups actually have slixers integrated because they work very well with the high temperatures especially if you have petroleum generators. I'll be focusing on three setups I kind of made to test slixers. I don't have any duplicates tending to them, but they still output the exact same amount of crude oil and consume the same amount of carbon dioxide. 
Let's get to the first one. This one uses a carbon dioxide vent. The main issue with the vents is that the carbon dioxide comes out at 932 degrees. That's hot. But there's something you should know. This here, specific heat capacity, I talked about it in the last tutorial. Carbon dioxide has such a tiny mass and it outputs so little, just 86 grams on average, that the second it touches anything, it immediately exchanges all its heat. Meaning you don't really need heat deletion. Although this room will heat up over time, you just bring in like a new slickster, you can put a temperature plate, you can do basically anything and it'll cool this room down enough. Now the reason I keep it just like this is it actually keeps it hot enough for the slicksters to live. The gas pumps are only here to take the excess carbon dioxide. This vent actually produces way too much. I only have three slicksters here. Three slicksters can consume 100 grams a second. And the design of this room is nothing special. I just put this floating so that all the liquid flows down onto the ground and so that the pump can pick it up. Only thing you should really know about building a room like this is that you actually don't need to insulate it that crazily. Sandstone should just do fine or any other basic material you have for insulation. Then you should definitely be using steel for all of your machines. For the doors, I heavily recommend either gold amalgam or another high temperature metal or steel. Your choice. Automation, it won't get hot enough in here to melt anything so you will be fine. Temperature plates aren't actually necessary. I was just testing some stuff in here. They're just here to make sure that everything stays the exact same temperature so these slicksters don't get too cold in one spot. And duplicate grooming is completely optional, though it is recommended if you want to turn this into like a slickster breeder. Then this gas setup, like I was saying, it's not necessary, but I like it because it's currently active, but once it goes dormant, this vent, it'll no longer produce carbon dioxide until it becomes active again. Meaning I want to store up as much carbon dioxide as possible so I can reuse it once this goes dormant. This is another one of my designs. This incorporates a geyser. Now the issue with slicksters is that they actually die if they get too cold. They enjoy the heat instead. So I had to make something like this. Carbon dioxide geysers output negative 67 degrees. That's kind of cold. Also, it will flash to gas practically instantly if it hits anything warmer than that. I built this setup this way for a few reasons. Now, the star of the show is our liquid tepidizer. What this does is it keeps the room pretty toasty. It can't go above 185, however, but that's okay for us. We're, no we're okay with normal slicksters. Since geysers only really overpressurize if there's too much liquid, they can't generally overpressurize if there's too much gas. This thing will keep spewing liquid infinitely. You'll also notice, however, this one averages about 150 grams of output. I also apologize, uh, debug mode's a little glitchy like that sometimes. This room is 96 tiles. That's the maximum size for a stable. You could make it even larger if you really wanted and you didn't use stables, but this is just how I designed it. I have eight slicksters in here. If we do the math again, 20,000, which is the amount of grams that slicksters consume a cycle, 600 being the seconds in a cycle, we get 33 grams. So slicksters consume 33 grams of carbon dioxide a second. And this outputs 150 grams, meaning we actually only need five. There's not really much else to say about this room. My main invention here was this whole setup. Liquid tepidizer, yet again, can be anything. Although it does cost 960 watts, it's actually pretty cheap to operate over time as it very rarely activates after it first warms up the entire room. And then the final design's a bit more interesting, we'll say. This one uses a thermo aqua tuner instead of a liquid tepidizer. This means that you can get way higher temperatures. There's also a little bit of automation involved. Not much, so I'll explain it. Normally, you would have a liquid pipe sensor, meaning if the liquid in a pipe is below or above a certain temperature, the thermal aqua tuner would activate. Instead, here, we just have a closed loop where you can dump the chill from the thermal aqua tuner into whatever we want, but we want the heat from it, not the chill. Automation is very simple. If it's below 
it'll activate the thermal aqua tuner and turn it on, and it will close the mechanized airlock. But currently, it's actually warm enough, meaning it opens the mechanized airlock using this knot gate. Extremely simple. The automation for the pumps, you don't actually have to have this. I just wanted this as a valve to turn on and off the liquid pumps. This is made out of aluminum and have plenty of temperature plates. So when it's outputting, it actually seals the carbon dioxide in there so that cold gas doesn't escape over here and hurt the slicksters. That's a bit better. I decided to change out this room for molten slicksters, which is what should be in here. And that's what this room is designed for. The thermal aqua tuner is only used so that we can get molten slicksters in here. Final thing that's important in this room, and like I said earlier, you can put the chill that the thermal aqua tuner generates anywhere. You can even just vent it out into your world. For testing purposes, I just built this liquid tepidizer, so if it gets too warm in here, it'll actually heat it up and allow you to keep this loop going. This is an extremely simple compact loop. I use polluted water here. You can use just about any liquid you want as long as you keep it above freezing. At least 30 degrees above freezing is the formula I use. That was our second and most common option for using carbon dioxide. And I even gave these setups for these rooms. Now for the last one. Before the vent erupts, I'll go over the setup here. This is a thermal aqua tuner. It's your general steam room setup. The insulated pipes can be made out of ceramic or even igneous rock or any other cheap material you want. But I use insulation just because I'm in sandbox mode. This is how it looks. It's your normal cooling setup. It runs through the steam turbine first to cool that down, and then it runs into the room. I'm using thermium radiant liquid pipes you can also use aluminum, which is my other favorite because it has such a high thermal conductivity and it's extremely close to thermium. But yet again, sandbox, I can use whatever materials I want. And for this, you should use supercoolant, but it's actually possible to use ethanol to freeze carbon dioxide. Meaning you could actually build this earlier game if you wanted to. The conveyor loader and auto sweep are made out of copper. Uh, it's a little dicey. You want to build this while the vent is dormant so that these don't overheat while you're trying to build it. And if you haven't noticed yet, what this whole design is meant to do is to freeze the carbon dioxide. Would you want to freeze it? Well, why not? I mean, there's no use for it frozen. It's a cool building material, but th th there's no real use for it. It just looks cool. Before it erupts, I should also note, I keep it around negative 90 degrees. That's just so the millisecond it actually erupts, it freezes the carbon dioxide. The other one looks the exact same as well. That's how it works. It just straight up freezes the carbon dioxide into a solid. Still, there's no real purpose to it. Once it's in this form, there's not actually much you can do with it. There are only two real options. You can put it in storage containers and then drop it to use it as a cooling source, although it's not very effective due to the specific heat capacity and the thermal conductivity. Or you can go ahead and get the natural tiles mod where you can build tiles out of any resource in the game, including carbon dioxide that's solidified and have fun. that places it at 68 degrees. However, there is one thing you should know. It places it at 68 degrees Fahrenheit. If you placed anything to update it, it would flash the carbon dioxide. So there is almost no point to it. It just looks cool. We can also see our geyser setup working. Now the geyser only looks different because this is horizontal while the vent is vertical. They are the exact same setup otherwise. Anyways, that's going to be it for this episode. It's a shame there aren't more uses for carbon dioxide in this game and subsequently carbon vents and geysers. I hope you guys enjoyed this tutorial on how to use carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide vents and geysers. Anyways, this is Enzo from Look Into Gaming, signing out.